Good morning. Um, welcome to this seminar entitled Elements of Chip Music. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm LFT, also known as Linus. And uh, I am a coder and a musician. And in both of these endeavors, I like working with small limited systems because I find that the constraints are, are both a challenge and a source of inspiration. So this seminar is going to be about constraints in specifically in chip music. And the seminar will start with some general background, uh, kind of from a technical point of view, and then it will gradually shift from a technical perspective to more artistic or musical perspective. And uh, so I'll introduce some terminology and then we'll dive into the constraints. And when I prepared the seminar, I, I listed like a dozen constraints or so. So I had to pick the most interesting ones. Uh, and if we have a couple of minutes left, I will mention some other ones. But th these are the four main constraints that we'll dive into. Uh, if you have questions, please just put up your hand or something, because if, if I can answer immediately, I will do that. Otherwise, I'll just put the question on hold until we get to the discussion phase. All right. So chip music is composed even today, but today we do it because we want to do it. And, and in this period, they basically did it because they had to do it, because that was the only way to include a soundtrack in your game or later in your intro or demo. So it becomes, it begs the question, why did it happen in this period? So why did chip music arise in this specific time frame? And to answer that question, I would like to start with the, how, how the human ear and brain perceive frequencies. Uh, because if something is happening uh, and it recurs, but it recurs very slowly, then we hear it as a kind of structural thing. And then when it's happening at kind of once per second, then we get a rhythmical perception. We might be tapping along with the music with the foot and so on. Then if we raise the frequency even, even more, we don't hear a rhythm anymore. We hear something else. And for lack of a better word, I'm calling this the effect range of frequencies. And then, of course, when we get into even higher frequencies, we start hearing notes, pitches. So what I'm proposing here is, and of course, the, there are no sharp edges like this. So it kind of blurs together. So what I'm proposing is that we add a time axis here, and we look at which frequencies were practical to work with uh, for cheap hardware, for some arbitrary definition of cheap, which corresponds to like home computers. And so. Uh, this is not scientific measurement or anything, it's just an illustration to show you what my idea is. But at some point, notably in the 80s, it started to become practical to work with uh, pitches in cheap hardware. And then when it becomes really interesting is when we add the software aspect as well, because software is slower than hardware. So then at some point later in, in the mid-90s, it became feasible to do everything in software. And then you were able to do a complete software synthesizer. And then it was kind of, so, so the hardware was the enabler which turned on the chiptune uh, possibility. And then in the 90s, the software sort of switched off the necessity to write chip music. And then the golden age of chip music was over. Uh, so keep these levels in mind, structure, rhythm, effect, and pitch, because they will recur during the talk. And so let's start with the first constraint here. And this is the set of waveforms that you have to choose from uh, when you're writing chip music. And they were put into the sound chip by a hardware engineer. And the hardware engineer had a reason for doing that. For, uh, so I'm, I'm wearing three waveforms today, the triangle, the square, and the noise. And those are typical chip music uh, waveforms. So why were these chosen and not some completely different waveforms? Well, the, uh, and the, the short answer is because they're cheap to implement. Uh, and there are a couple of ways you would go about when designing a sound chip. One is to start with an idea. For instance, from the world of analog synthesizers. Uh, they were working with sine waves, so it m would have been a good idea to include a sine wave. But they are a bit expensive to implement, so you make it cheaper and it becomes a triangle wave, and then you make it even cheaper, it becomes a four-bit triangle. And we're going to listen to these just so you hear what I'm talking about. So this is first a sine, and then a triangle, and then a four-bit triangle. <laughs> And of 
course, then if you go even further to three bits and two bits, then it doesn't really sound like a triangle at all. So this is at the limit of how cheap you can implement it. And that is what they did in the Nintendo Entertainment System. So that's a very characteristic sound, uh, the four-bit triangle. Then a, a different way of designing a chip would be to start with something that's really cheap to implement and listen to it and think, well, it's a sound, we'll include it in the chip. And then you start thinking, well, if I add a parameter, in this case the pulse width or duty cycle, then we can offer the artist a choice of different sounds for the price of just one hardware component. So that is probably why they included a pulse, pulse wave, because you get a lot of different sounds for the price of one. So we're going to hear first a square wave and then a series of progressively more narrow pulse waves. All right. And then uh, you can, of course, com combine these approaches. So you start with uh, an idea, you want to do white noise, and then you think, yeah, I have to do a random number generator. How do I do that cheaply? Well, I use a linear feedback shift register. Then I make it even cheaper, and then you start to get the random number generator that repeats itself. So then you get some kind of a pitch into it. And then you get the metallic noise. So we're going to listen to first white noise, and then the metallic noise. And, and, and this, once again, you can, you can make a parameter out of this. So then you get a couple of different sounds for the price of just one hardware block. So now we have a handful of, of different waveforms uh, corresponding to what was available in the Nintendo. Uh, with the SID chip, you had more waveforms, but you still had a limited amount to choose from. Um, so then, as a composer, how would you handle this situation? The first option is obviously to compose using only the available sounds. And that is, that is a traditional way of composing music, because if you have an orchestra or a rock band, in rock band you have your bass player, you have a vocalist, you have drums, and you have a guitar, and you can't just invent new sounds. So this is kind of the obvious route forward. So many composers used that option. The second option is to try to invent new sounds. And uh, the, the, um, the sound chip it sits in a computer and you can, you can kind of abuse the computer. You can tell it to do some things that you can't tell to a human musician. Uh, you can do things very quickly, for instance. So it becomes possible to, to, uh, to combine these available sounds into new sounds. And uh, we're going to look into a couple of ways of doing that. So uh, one interesting effect is the flange effect. And that's where you play the same sound in two channels at the same time, but you detune one of the channels. It's a little bit out of pitch. Uh, we're going to listen to an excerpt from a Nintendo uh, tune here, where we first listen to just channel one, and then we listen to the same thing with both channels one and two, and you'll hear the flange effect. <laughs> Now both channels one and two. So if you can do this for every waveform, then you suddenly have double the, your amount of available waveforms that you can choose from. Another way to do that is to realize that waveforms sound very different in the low register and in the high register. Uh, so we're going to listen to a triangle wave, first in the bass and then in the treble. So while it's the exact same waveform, it sounds like two different instruments. And this is a very traditional way of, of doing things, because in a piano, if you think about it, all the, the mechanism is identical for every key, but the sound in the bass is different from the sound in the treble, so you can kind of get the illusion of having a bass part, a treble part, and something in the middle. So, but, but now you have twice the amount of sound waves available again, even though they are mathematically identical. Then you can start uh, going further, because if you read the documentation for a sound chip, you typically get the impression that you're supposed to set up the pitch and waveform number, and then you start the note, and a little bit later you stop the note. And that is a very naive way of, of looking at things, and you get kind of a very boring, dead character to the sound. So what you can do is you can modify the hardware registers during the, the note, and then you can do a lot of 
cool effects. So we're going to listen to the first note from the Whizball music, which illustrates vibrato, pulse width modulation, and glide. So that is pul a pulse wave. If we go back and listen to the, the raw uh, pulse wave. This is much more dead uh, in character from the living vibrato sound. And sometimes you want the dead character, and sometimes you want the living character. So, so now you have uh, multiplied the amount of available sounds once more. Then, of course, if you can modify the parameters uh, quickly, then you can change the, the, the sound completely. So we're going to listen to a snare drum here. Right, so what Gerontel is doing here is he's very rapidly going from pulse wave to noise to pulse wave at a different frequency and, and so on. And if he had done this at the rhythmical range of frequencies, if you remember from the chart, then it, we would have heard it as a sequence of different sounds. But since he's doing it at the effect range of frequencies, we hear one drum hit here. So then you might be thinking, well, if we can invent new sounds by doing this at the effect range. What if you go even further and go up into the pitch range of frequencies? And then you get into what I like to call extreme play routines. And we're going to listen to an excerpt from a SID here. So while, while this music is running on a sound chip on a home computer, you still get these kind of reactions, uh, which are opinions, of course. You don't have to agree, but they, they have, there is something to it. I mean, it doesn't sound like a chiptune anymore. And I would like to argue that the difference is that they are actually updating the registers at a higher rate, higher frequency than the effect range. So they're into the, way into the pitch range of frequencies. So if you want to have an objective way of expressing these sentiments, you can say, well, it's not a chip tune if you do this, if you update the registers too quickly. So that was the first constraint. Uh, now we come into the second one, which is the limited number of frequencies that you can use. And this might seem a bit odd to you, because this is not an issue for the SID chip, and it's not an issue for the Nintendo sound chip, and it's generally not a problem, but there are some notable exceptions. And that is, for instance, the Atari 2600. Because it had a sound chip, but it was intended for sound effects and not for music. But people wanted to make music for it anyway. And then they had to, to kind of work with the fact that you only had 32 different notes that you could use. And they were not from a musical scale. They were from this formula here, which is F, which is based on the television standard, and then divided by some integer value. And you get a lot of weird, I mean, every note is a note in itself, but they don't fit together very well. So then you can, you can go three, three ways. You can adapt to the situation and only use a handful of notes that happen to be on a musical scale uh, or close enough. Or a second approach is to try to technically work around the problem. And, and people have done this and, and come very far, but it, it took a while to invent these techniques. Uh, so and the third option is to basically ignore the fact that your music is out of tune. So I, I'd like to, to play an excerpt that illustrates the third option here. So then, if you look outside the world of chip music, maybe we can find the same constraints there. And it turns out that if you, if you think of a trumpet, you know it, it has valves, right? Where you push down your fingers to create different notes. But this is a relatively recent invention. So if you go back a couple of hundreds of years, the trumpets did not have valves, and you could only play notes from the overtone series. Uh, and that is a fundamental frequency multiplied by an integer. So it's basically 
it looks the same, but it's multiplication instead of division, right? So we're going to listen to a piece where the composer went for the first approach, working with only a very few notes. And this is four notes. Uh, there are three, four, five, and six times the fundamental frequency. It's certainly feasible to work with very limited set of notes. So then you might be thinking, well, this was for the Atari 2600. It doesn't really concern chip music at large. But interestingly, if we take the same constraint and we move it from the pitch range of frequencies down into effects and rhythm, specifically rhythm, then we get uh, the fact that all your rhythmical stuff has to be a multiple of the frame rate of the computer. So if you know the television signal consists of frames, and they come at 50 hertz in Europe. And in between the frames, there's a little period called the vertical blanking gap. And that is where you, have, where you don't need the, the CPU to do graphics. So then you can do music instead. So, but that means that all your updates to the SID registers or to the, your sound chip registers have to occur in multiples of 20 milliseconds, which compares, uh, corresponds to 50 hertz. Right? So then you're stuck with the choice of Tempe. And in Europe, you're stuck with these. There, I mean, there are some slower ones and some faster ones, but you're, you're on a grid of Tempe. And in the US and Japan, they have a different television standard, so then you have a different set of Tempe to work with. And so if you're a, a game soundtrack composer, you might be thinking, well, I don't want my music to sound different in different parts of the world. And then you have to choose 150 beats per minute. And that's, that's that. So, so there's a lot of cheap music composed in 150 beats per minute. It's uh, the ubiquitous chip music tempo. So we're going to listen to a couple of excerpts here from classical uh, chip tunes. And they all have the exact same tempo. And if you listen to a lot of chip music, you, get to, you instantly recognize this. Oh, it's a 150. Yeah. So there are a couple of ways to kind of get around this. And then you, uh, first of all, if, you, if, you want, if you're content with having your music sound a little bit different in different parts of the world, then you can pick other tempi from that set. And then also, I, I, I didn't mention it, but uh, these are assuming that you want to divide every beat into four sub-beats, so corresponding to 16th notes. But if you, if you can divide your beats into three, then you get a different set of tempi. And if you can divide it into sub-beats that have different duration. Then you get a groove on, in the tempo, and then you get a different set of them. You, you're always on a grid, so you, you always have to pick from a small set of tempi. Uh, so outside the world of chip music, the, you don't really find that kind of exact requirement that it has to be like a function of the television standard. But you get 
for instance, dance music and also march music tend to be in a convenient tempo for whatever you're using the music for. So that's why you might think that all military march music sounds the same. And people sometimes think that about cheap music as well, because it has a, a fixed tempo. So now we come to the final, and I would say maybe the most important constraint. And this is the, the limited number of voices or channels that you can work with. Because a sound chip would typically have three or maybe four or five channels. Sometimes they are fixed in the sense that you, you have a triangle where you can, uh, you have a channel where you can only play triangle waves or a channel where you can only play noise and so on. Um, and this is, once again, this is similar to how, how composers have always been working because if you have your orchestra or your band, then you're stuck with the number of musicians you have. Uh, but in a sound chip, you can uh, very quickly reuse a channel to do something else. And this opens up a lot of possibilities and they, they are a bit different depending on how quickly you do this. So if we start at the effect range of frequencies, then we find, for instance, the arpeggio, which is a trademark sound for the chip music uh, style. And this is where you rapidly, you want to play a chord, but you only want to use one channel, so you rapidly go through the, the notes in the chord. And that creates a very busy sound. Uh, you can also call it living, if you want a more positive word for it. Uh, it's very similar to the effect you get from a tremolo in orchestral music, where we have all the people in the string section are playing one pitch each, but they are playing lots of very brief notes after each other. So we're going to listen to first an arpeggio and then the tremolo. Right? And then, of course, this is at the effect rate, because if you did it at the rhythmical rate, you would hear a melody instead. But since you're doing it so quickly, we hear it as a chord. But of course, if your musician is good enough, then you can make him or her play at the effect rate. And then you can create the same kind of effect. So we're going to listen to an excerpt here from my favorite 18th century chip tune, uh, where, where arpeggios are used to create uh, the illusion of chords on a monof monophonic instrument. So that was channel sharing at the effect rate. What if we do it at the rhythmical rate? Then we get uh, something I like to call split parts. And that is if you have two melodies going on at the same time, but there are the rests in one melody coincide with notes in the other melody, then of course they can share a channel because they don't play at the same time. And if they are uh, distinct enough, then for instance one is in the bass and one is in the treble, then the brain is going to hear two melodies going on, uh, even though they are sharing a channel. So I I'd like to give you an example from my own production here, uh, from Kraft. And we're going to listen to one channel, and there's two things going on. There's some kind of a chord thing going on with arpeggios, and there's also a more high-pitched melody. I think this is a very good example of how constraints shape the, the process of composing because you have to, basically, you don't, you don't get a kind of a vision of a melody and then you put it down. You have to work with the machine and the sh machine is helping you compose your melody because you have to obey these sort of constraints that are available. Yeah, so, so this also occurs outside the world of chip music. Uh, the example is a bit different because uh, a piano, this is a piano piece, and you might be thinking that a piano has unlimited polyphony. You can press down all the keys at once. But the problem is, of course, that you only have 10 fingers. 
So, so you have a limited polyphony. And in this case, there are some chords that are so wide that you need both hands to play them. So the pianist has to move his hands from bass to treble back and forth, even though we hear it as two things going on at the same time. So if you're lucky enough to work with a sound chip where the channels don't have a fixed waveform, then you can change more radically than just going from low frequencies to high frequencies. So you can, uh, for instance, have a bass and drum part in one channel. And this is very common in chip music. It's kind of a Hubbard trademark, but, but others have been using it extensively. So we're just going to listen to what it sounds like. And of course, if you go outside the world of chip music, you get something like this. Because, of course, the slapping technique in, on, uh, used on a double bass here means that you, you can't play a note and this kind of a drum at the same time. So you still have to compose using that constraint. So now we move further down to the structural range of frequencies. And then we get into something which might be, be a, a bad habit of some composers. And the thing is that melodies tend to have breaks in them. We like melodies that, that first they have, do something and then there's a break. And then they do maybe the same thing again or, or something differently. But that break, it leaves kind of a nagging feeling in the seasoned chiptune composer because he knows he only has two or three channels to work with and it feels like a waste to, to just have silence in there. So then you get into the habit of filling in the gaps. And it's very common, but it's not common to be as extreme as in this case. So we're going to listen to the first channel of uh, Last V8. a child who can't sit still. He has to do something every, every time, each second. Right, so then that was channel sharing. But if you don't want to do channel sharing, you want to, you, you want to think that one channel is one uh, instrument, for instance, in a, in a band. Then you get into an interesting situation. Suppose you're a, a Japanese, you graduated with, in some, some kind of uh, composing music, uh, musical college or whatever they call it and you studied contemporary harmony, such as jazz harmony, and then you wanted to make soundtracks, so you got a job in the, sound, in the game industry to make soundtracks. And then you, jazz chords always have at least four notes, and the NES only has three channels. So what do you do? Well, you have to drop one of the notes, right? So if we start by, by listening to uh, the, the most common jazz chord, the major seventh chord, uh, and also the minor seventh chord, So if you have to drop one of the notes, what do you do? Well, if you drop the seventh, you get a normal major chord. And that's nothing remarkable. If you drop the first, you get the normal minor chord. So, but it gets interesting when you drop one of the other notes, specifically when you drop the fifth. And then you get something I like to call the Famicord, because you know the Nintendo Entertainment System was called Famicom in Japan. So this is the Famicord. I'm going to listen to it first. And this chord turns up everywhere in Nintendo music, but not as much in other music. So, so it's kind of an invention of the chiptune era. And the reason why, why you don't hear it in other music is that the fifth has, a, has an important function. 
I, I, I don't have time to go into the details, but there is a dissonance in the chord which is mitigated by the fifth. So if you, remove, if you remove the fifth, you get a very dissonant chord. And that is typically not something you want to have. So my theory is that in chip music, for, well, first of all, you have to remove one note. But second, uh, the sound environment is very harsh. The sounds themselves are very dissonant. So it doesn't hurt as much to create a dissonant chord. So that is, I think, w why it's so prevalent in uh, Nintendo music. So my final example here is a, a couple of snippets of uh, Nintendo soundtracks. And I will indicate when, when you hear the Famicord. It, of course, there's a major and a minor one, but the, it's most commonly the major one you're going to hear. So now I'll just briefly mention some of the other constraints. Uh, there is a limit to the, to the amount of memory, and that means you want to compress your music. And a good way of achieving compression is procedural generation. And that means patterns, uh, sometimes transposed patterns, but still patterns. And the downside to patterns is that they tend to coincide with bars in the music. Maybe one pattern is two bars or something like that. And that means you can only express repetition in whole bars. And that, in turn, means that you avoid upbeats. Um, it's certainly not impossible to make upbeats. There, there are upbeats, but, but still, most chiptune melodies do not have upbeats. And I, I, it has to do with the limited amount of memory. Uh, second one here, game mechanics. Sorry, uh, Sorry I have a question. Yeah? Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not familiar with the, with the expression upbeat. Should explain? Yes, so the question is, what is an upbeat? That is when you... Uh, start a melody before the bar. So, yeah, yeah okay. um, Good question, thank you. Um, so the game mechanics sound effects channel is where the, when the player is jumping or shooting, then you need to have a sound effect. And the sound effect is going to steal one channel from the, from the music. So then you have to, either you compose using even more limited number of channels, or you put all the important stuff in one part, and you put all the unimportant stuff in one channel. And this, I mean, this influences the compositional process, but specifically it does so if you have fixed waveforms on your channels. And then you have to decide that, okay, I put all the unimportant stuff in the triangle channel, then I can only have triangle in the sound effects. And then, so so it, and you, you see how it influences the composition process. Uh, second one here, instant context context switch is where uh, the jingles for level complete or game over, they don't start from silence. They start from whatever chord you happen to be in, in the background music. So then they have to very quickly establish the tonality. And one way to do that is to have a rising series of whole steps. And that is very common in level complete jingles because it has a kind of a triumphant character as well. Uh, limited dynamics, if you don't have full com control of the volume, which is common in some chips, uh, then you have to do dynamics by going to a different waveform. So, uh, and that is very similar to how you would write organ music for a church organ, for instance. And I could go on for hours, I suppose. But let's not do that. Let's go into the discussion phase. Do you have any questions? You've got to have some questions. Everything is crystal clear. <laughs> yeah? Um, one thing that came to my mind when you 
explained this channel sharing is uh, that uh, I think in uh, in electronic music or modern electronic music you have sometimes um, very strong compression, mm -hmm. and um, I have always the impression that this channel sharing is basically a very strong compression um, because. You know, uh, for example, the snare in in, in your example uh, of the bass sharing sh channel with the snare, you could could imagine that the original sound source in the original sound source the snare was so loud that it, it uh, uh, during uh, by compression the bass vanished and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I think this has also the effect that chips tunes tend to have a very loud impression, if you uh, at least to to un uneducated ears maybe <laughs> mm -hmm. so this is uh, something that came to my mind when you yes explain channel sharing so very interesting observation mm. because that is how how uh, audio compression works it's the same effect that you hear you can hear your clock ticking but when the alarm alarm clock is ringing you don't hear the ticking anymore even though it's there it's the same effect that they use when they do mp3 compression and so on and so basically you're saying if your snare drum is loud enough then it doesn't matter if there is a bass note Yeah. So okay, so it's not about uh, compression as in MP3 compression. It's about the compressor effect that yeah. is used. Yeah, that I agree. That's but it's it's valid in both cases. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Further questions. So, uh, given all your experience with uh, ship music and different ships and everything, what would be your ultimate ship to, to, to make music for? The, the, do you mean what would be the ultimate sound chip? To yeah, so, to so work given with? all the, yeah, so if you could, if you could pick features from, from all the ships you yeah, talk about, okay. what would be the, the best hybrid ship to, to work with? Right. Um, that is very interesting because nowadays when we compose chip music, we can use I mean, we can go around, we're not limited technically by these constraints anymore. We can choose any constraints. We can create a chiptune tracker where you can do basically everything. And to get a feeling of chiptune, you still pick some constraints that you think are, are uh, typical for chip music. But you could, I mean, you could have 20 channels and uh, lots of different sound waveforms to choose from. I would say that the, if we go back to the, here. So the most important ones are waveforms and polyphony. The other two are here because they are interesting and because they make entertaining seminar. But number one and number four are the most important ones. Um, to get that feeling of chip tune. And then, of course, the, the fact that, that you don't update the registers of the sound chip too quickly. So you, you have to kind of, it's, it's very different difficult to describe because it's very subjective as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, basically, y you, have to, you have to simulate this. So you have to simulate that the artist only has access to the uh, cyan kind of range of frequencies, which means that you can't really update sound chip registers in, in uh, quickly. So, so quickly that you get into the pitch range. And then at the same time, the magenta part, which is what the hardware was doing, has to be kind of, it has to stick to these waveforms that were very cheap to implement. Then of course, I mean, if you look at the Game Boy, they have, they realized that the four bit triangle and the, the pulse waves, they could all be expressed using very short samples. So if you have a sample with length 32, for instance, then you can express all of these basic waveforms, not the noise, but the other ones. And so then that was the approach they took. And then you can also go beyond those waveforms and create other waveforms uh, using that limitation. And it still sounds kind of like a chip tune. So it's subjective. Is that a good answer? Yeah. OK. Any? Yeah. What's your favorite? My favorite chip, that is a good question. The, I think you deduced that the, I, I'm, I know much about two chips, and that's a SID chip and the thing that's used in the Nintendo. It's called 
to A03 or something. Um, but uh, so so they have their pros and cons, and the SID chip is very versatile, and that is both. I mean, that, is, that is, means less constraints, so it's not as fun to work with in that aspect, and, and it's not as uh, inspiring in that sense. So, so I need to have a very constrained environment. So that means that maybe the NES is more interesting. And then I have a more, eh, I, I think there are, there are some, some features of the SID chip that sometimes I want to use. So, so it varies, depends. On, I, I like variety, and, and, and I, I would pick one of those two but different on different days. Yeah? Um, how do you approach uh, the composition of the chip tune? So, so the question is... How, how do you uh, approach the composition of a chip tune? You mentioned at, um, at the beginning that the, the restraints help help you mm -hmm. in your composition. Mm -hmm. So it seems that um, the, the, the approach of, for example, creating some big composition with high-end equipment and then uh, so, sort of uh, uh, compiling it into chiptune format is not the way you work. That is, is it? correct. Uh, I mean, I mm, there are lots of covers. There are lots of chiptune covers that people have been doing, and I do that occasionally as well. But it's, that's completely different, because then you have a blueprint of what you want it to sound like. But if you have, are more in the creative mode and you, you want to invent some new music, then maybe if you start with a melody and you listen to that and you, you get into the split parts thing, you think, why, what can I put in the gaps here and what can I, how, how does it sound if I, if I add an arpeggio channel here, maybe that's too much, so maybe I remove that. So it's a very, very iterative process. You make small changes and you listen to them and you often run into the constraints and then, then you only have one choice, so that's how it influences your composition. Uh, when I mentioned patterns uh, briefly, that, that, and also transposition of uh, patterns, that means that you often hear some kind of loop thing going on with the, maybe the drums and the bass, and then it gets transposed into a different key because that is very, uh, both memory efficient, but also very practical to do in a tracker environment, specifically a hyper tracker that most chip music trackers are, which means that you can control each channel independently in, in, your, in your song. So that each track is only each pattern is only one channel wide, and you can recombine them uh, in different ways. And then it becomes really easy to transpose just the bass, and then have a completely new pattern for the melody, for instance. So, so that also affects the composition of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're running this presentation from that board that's sitting there, right? Yes. So the question is, what am I running the presentation on? Uh, it's a microcontroller-based slide presentation thing. Uh, it reads the, uh, the slides and the sound clips from the SD card, and it's, it's based on a propeller chip, and it creates VGA and line-out signal. <laughs> PowerPoint? Yeah. Never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about that. I might release a schematic for you. <laughs> yeah? So, uh, now that you brought this graph up again, I'm pretty much wondering, like, uh, chiptunes nowadays uh, pretty much could qualify as uh, streamed music as well. like. The boundaries just uh, kept running into each other, and you couldn't, you could basically not distinguish a modern chip tune from uh, from software-based music anymore. As long as you don't make the software too complex, so you go beyond the original limitations. Uh, yes, I think emulators of sound chips are becoming really good now, and and it's. I, I would be surprised if people could actually hear the difference in a blind test. That being said, like this one, I mean, I mean it's fun to do it in a certain way. It's fun to work with old hardware and uh, limited hardware. So, but, but if you're just producing music that people are going to listen to and they don't care what process is behind the music, then you can use a modern computer. So basically as well that 
if you would extend this graph maybe into 2010, mm -hmm. the software curve would go above the hardware curve because yeah. the hardware is just simply not um, uh -huh. being developed anymore? No, I'm, I'm, so this is a very simplified picture because, yeah. uh, for instance, the, the top line here, the magenta border, is going to be more jagged because new inventions rise the bar. And also, it's for some cheap hardware. I mean, every, nowadays, cheap hardware can go very high. And you don't, I mean, the, the relative difference between this gap, so there's a gap between software and hardware, which is relatively constant. So, so the higher you go, the more uh, the, the, the difference between the height of the graph and this difference becomes less and less relevant. So it approaches a situation where, where it's not as important anymore. Yeah. Uh, on uh, which sound chip did you start actually composing uh, chip music? I actually, and when? <laughs> yeah. So personally, I, my first exposure to chip music was on the Amiga. So that's a uh, protractor using sample, small samples. And then there was the uh, famous AHX tracker for the Amiga, which I composed using. Thanks, uh, I wrote it. <laughs> ah, it's you. And then, uh, uh, of course, I started discovering the SID. And I listened to a lot of SID music, so it was fun to start working with it directly. And then, uh, much more lately, uh, when I listened to the music composed by Vert, uh, then I kind of realized that the Nintendo sound chip is also very interesting to work with. So that's my uh, brief history of chip music, personally. OK. You're Feeling satisfied? No more open ends, no loose ends? Okay.